Hi guys, nice turnout. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and um, close all the attendees and I'm going to share my screen. Perfect. Always a good sign when you get uh, a bunch of folks who want to listen to you talk about montages, which can, you know, it's funny, it feels like one of the more dry topics in the world of EEG. Um, but it's actually riveting. So let me make sure that I've got my screens properly aligned here. I'm going to stop my share and share my screen and I'll share the screen. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So um, you should be seeing uh, the use and misuse of montages in EEG analysis. And um, I'm going to jump on in. So um, hopefully this talk is of some use to you. The objective of this talk for me was sort of scraping the barrel and seeing what don't I know about montaging. Um, uh, and, and, and what can I learn? And I did learn some stuff in the uh, pulling together of this presentation. And so we'll start at the very beginning, um, which is how we quantify EEG. And the EEG you see on the left is of course the seminal text of the individual. The EEG on the right is the quantification of that text. What we're what we're essentially doing is we're using something called fast Fourier transform and we're taking the raw brain activity and we're decomposing it through a Fourier transform into its disparate frequency bins. Okay. And so Fourier analysis is how we separate a signal into its component parts, which is really useful, right? And, and initially, I think almost all of us uh, begin by reading maps because it's a it's a watered down translation. It makes it simpler to understand what's going on. Um, we all know delta, theta, alpha, beta, and high beta, um, but there's so much more going on, of course, beyond just that fundamental translation. And so that's what this lecture is about in part. Um, and so know that when you're doing the quantification, when you are doing that translation of what I call the seminal text, which is the individual's narrative as seen in their EEG, you're using a, a mathematical tool, uh, a machine to study a biological phenomenon. And what it does then is it converts that uh, beautiful biological variability into the assumption that what it's looking at are sinusoidal waveforms. And so, of course, we lose the morphology of the data when we push it through a fast Fourier transform. Um, we know that brain waves aren't necessarily sinusoidal, right? They're, they are not consistent in frequency, power, and morphology. There's all different shapes, there's all different sizes. Uh, oftentimes there's aperiodic or arrhythmic um, frequencies in the brain, output by the brain. And so to apply the fast Fourier transform will create a level of distortion in the data. One of the distortions that you get with an FFT is harmonics, right? Um, so that's just a, a multiple. So when you get a 10 hertz alpha, you might see that that person also has a really high amplitude 20 hertz signal and that would be a simple harmonic of the brain. But um, I bet you didn't know that that was due to the FFT, right? I see you're already learning stuff. So um, brain maps are great. In fact, I remember when I first got into the field uh, a few years deep and I was working with a neurologist 
And he really kind of thumbed his nose at brain maps. And um, every normative database, every quantitative database has its warts. You know, they all have their shortcomings. Um, I use a handful in this presentation of different um, softwares, um, as you will see. But one of the things that the FFT deprives us of are um, understanding what's happening from just the raw data itself, which is going to take us into montaging because montages really can make things pop. And that's what we're after. We're really after understanding what it is we're, we're, we're sniffing out and then the why, the etiology, right? So FFT can overlook epileptiform discharges. Here we have a, a subtle spike and a wave. Now, the fast Fourier transform would interpret that spike, I don't know, as approximately, let's say, a 100 milliseconds in length, something like that. It might say that's an alpha wavelet, something like that, 70 milliseconds. The big swooping um, swing after that, the wave, it would, it would interpret as a delta. FFT will overlook transients. It would interpret this you know, in perhaps some alpha and a, again, a delta range. But what we're seeing is you know, just a subtle transient in the data. K complexes, um, which are so rich uh, in the sense that you can actually feel what the sleeping brain looks like. Um, well, an FFT would translate the red box into a midline theta and the green box into some beta content. Of course, what we have here is a, a V wave down the midline, also called a vertex sharp, and beta spindles, the stabilizing mechanism of sleep, um, called a K complex because uh, if you were to hear a knock, K, N O C K knock, you uh, would not awaken from that knock due to the stabilization uh, provided by the spindles. Wickets and FFT will simply make these look like alpha right at the midline. And occipital intermittent rhythmic delta activity, another uh, finding that would just look like an occipital delta. Well, and then there's beta variations. And so this idea of spindling beta has uh, lots of etiologies, right? There's the ADHD, which would quantify like that, right? This is a normative database that I'm looking at, but it's still a quantitative database. Anxiety would have a different profile, right? ADHD, frontal beta spindles. Anxiety, which in this case, diffuse beta spindles, would look more like this in a normative database. A benzodiazepine, about an 18 to 22 hertz beta spindle, uh, global, uh, representing a, a systemic effect of a medication on the EEG, looks very similar to that one, right? variations on a theme from a quantitative perspective. And then uh, lastly, EMG, you know it because it's hashy, it's spiky, it doesn't have phase and field, you know, but it really can look like real data. And so there's, um, there's tools, there's shortcuts, there's ways to really artifact data, there's ways to discern real from fake. Um, but before that, there's montaging. In the beginning, there was montaging. So you know this, right? Montages are logical and orderly arrangements of channels, electrode pairs, with waveforms representing the potential difference between the two electrodes. You might not know this though, that you never record from a single electrode, but it's always the difference between at least two electrodes, between the active and the reference electrode. That's called a derivation, also called a channel, right? Um, so each EEG channel records a variation in double-ended voltage differences. So we're going to jump in out the gate into bipolar montages. Um, and bipolar montages are montages where we're looking at each electrode in a chain, uh, one to its neighbor, that one to its neighbor, and so on, right? And so what we have here is an anterior to a posterior montage from the front to the back, 
obviously. Um, uh, this is a, called a long, longitudinal uh, bipolar montage, also called a double banana. Right, obviously, because it looks like we have two bananas on the head. Um, these are used in neurology the most. And the reason is that neurology is foremost focused upon finding abnormalities in, in the brain, right? People go to neurologists uh, because they're having epileptiform discharges or, or seizures or strange neurological goings on. And, um, and a bipolar montage will show us phase reversals, which is what we're going to look at. Um, in this case, we have a transverse bipolar montage where we're looking uh, at, the, at the line of electrodes running sagittally across the head, excuse me, coronally across the head. So um, let's look at a, a transverse bipolar uh, montage for a sleeping EEG. Now you can see right out the gate, we have a, a linked ears montage. This is what most of us record from. And my home base is an average montage. Um, that's where I spend most of my time. Now we're going to find fault and uh, we're going to find good stuff in every montage. So right now we're in an average montage and we have somebody that's starting to fall asleep. And what we see there, if you follow my little arrow, is a vertex sharp. Remember a moment ago, I talked about K-complexes. Well, we push out a big, a big theta discharge when we're falling asleep. So I've moved just now to a longitudinal transverse bipolar montage. If you look at each electrode pair at each derivation, um, you can see that um, we're moving uh, in a double banana montage. The CZ right in the middle, C4 to CC and CZ to C3, when you look at those two um, lines, those two derivations, you can see a phase reversal, right? And that's where the electrodes kiss. That's where they come together. It almost looks like a um, like an argyle pattern, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna play this from the get go again, and and we'll see why uh, why this is helpful for a sleeping EEG. There it is. And there it is again, a vertex sharp, triangular shaped theta discharge at the midline paired with the sleep spindles equals NREM2, a K complex. We go to a transverse, excuse me, a bipolar montage, and uh, we see those uh, phase reversals. And it says CZ is the spot. Why? Because CZ is the uh, electrode that both of those channels, both of those pairs have in common. Right? And so this is one way to localize data in an EEG is to move to a bipolar montage. It's going to show us where things are focally, right? And right here, we're seeing those phase reversals one more time and we're seeing those beta spindles, but you might notice um, that there's a lot of slow content rolling through the entire EEG. We're going to talk about ways to get around that as well. Right? So when you when you're cruising around in a bipolar montage, um, the 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 best use of it would be to detect seizure foci, lesions, uh, regions where there's not enough blood, like hypoperfusion, um, infarcts, right, uh, white matter ischemia. Bipolar montages are great at finding focal things. They're good for phase reversals, right? If the first electrode in the tracing line is more positive than the second, you get a positive or a downward deflection. And if the second electrode is more positive, you get a negative or an upward deflection. But this video um, is, is much better at explaining this than I am, right? So let's say you have a source of a thing, something slow, and the source of the slow is a negative 50 microvolt charge, right? Well, that negative 50 might be picked up as a negative 40 at T4, a uh, negative 20 at F8, negative 10 at T6, maybe it's zero at O2 and negative five at FP2. So in a bipolar montage, what we're doing is we're subtracting 
the reference from the active. And if you know simple math, when you get a positive number like we have here, you would see the uh, EEG electrode point downward. And when it's a negative, it would point up. Electronegative is up, electropositive is down. And so you can see the way that um, the source of a focus, uh, an electrical focus, would create something like a phase reversal in the EEG. Hence the use of a bipolar montage. Good for, uh, good for sourcing. So this is a good term to know, and it's one that completely applies to us if you're in the field of EEG, and it's volume conduction. And volume conduction is the transmission, the rippling of electrical current from its source through the conductors, which in this case are brain tissues, uh, towards the measurement device, so EEG electrodes. And there's a lot of stuff that can get in the way, right, of uh, that signal being picked up. Um, the orientation of the dipole in a fundamental sense, um, also the resistance of the brain, the skull, the scalp, the eye, eye holes in a sort of a confounding sense. Um, and so current doesn't flow simply between two poles of a dipole. It has to move through a conductor and it's gonna get blurred as a consequence. This is one of the reasons why EEG is not so good at sourcing activity. Um, something might happen in one part of the brain, but it could get recorded at other parts of the brain as well, right? Um, and so if we have positive and, elect and negative electrical charges and we have um, neurons pointing in different directions, right, um, running perpendicular to um, the surface of the brain, uh, it's going to create discharges. And you can't necessarily predict where the dipole is based upon just the raw EEG. Um, one of the reasons why we see low voltage EEGs are because there's this poor synchronization. And poor synchronization, um, like we see in people who have emotional tension, um, uh, that, that low voltage anxiety profile, uh, it's, it's because we're not getting adequate volume conduction. The tissues, what's happening in the tissues is effectively getting canceled out. So, here, um, we're going to move into a bipolar montage to find the foci of something slow. We're going to link gears to begin, which is where we almost always start, usually from a recording perspective. And I'm moving to a longitudinal bipolar montage. Now, what we see here at T5 and at T6 are phase reversals, right? Indicating what? Indicating uh, foci of something in the brain of the, of the slow content but then again the why right the etiology that's to me always sort of the most interesting piece so we can see that these latter two pairs share the electrode of t6 in common and when we remontage to a transverse bipolar there it is again t6 is the electrode shared in common for those phase reversals yeah and so when there's a lack of oxygen at any part of the brain, what happens is a consequential slowing of the, uh, of the alpha in that area. This is a, a pretty, um, this is a pathologically aged brain. Um, however, it's a, a proclivity that the aging brain leans towards, which is uh, slowings at the posterior temporal lobes, sometimes at the anterior temporal lobes. If you're a clinician and you've worked with an older population, chances are good that you've seen slow content at T5, T6, right? Um, and that slow content, if it's the slow edge of alpha, if you see alpha sort of dipping into the sevens, eights, or if that alpha waveform has sort of a pregnant bulge, I shouldn't say waveform, or if that alpha um, uh, transform, the fast Fourier transform on a spectral display, if the alpha shows a pregnant bulge, that would be the the slowage of alpha. And so the, you know, the line that we all know is the slowage of alpha tracks ischemia. The slowage of alpha is going to point um, to 
uh, the fact that there are some subtle changes in the brain due to what arthrosclerosis or um, you know um, some vascular issues, right? And there can be lots and lots of uh, symptoms as a consequence. Somebody could have headaches, right? A lot of times I'll look for um, vasoconstriction in headaches. So you know the slowing of alpha at the temporals would be one reason for headaches or um, word finding, right? If you saw slow foci, F7, F8, um, spatial disturbances, um, and so on and so forth. And so your bipolar montage is gonna be very helpful for you in finding foci. Uh, what I'd like for you to remember is that you're really going to be using bipolar montaging for slow content. There's really no need to look uh, at a bipolar for beta content, right? Um, even alpha, you can find the focus sometimes of something, but whether or not that something is relevant is very important to remember. And so um, as a general rule of thumb, you can save your phase reversal uh, sleuthing for uh, slow content, anything under eight hertz, eight hertz or under. So the common reference montages, they're good for awake EEGs. They're bad for asleep EEGs. Um, and generally speaking, you know, I would say they're they're good for um, for global findings, right? Rarely do we use CZ, although, I mean, I think we all have the option in our various software packages. There's common reference montages like the mastoid, um, and this is one cap that uses the mastoid reference. Um, there is the ipsilateral mastoid, the contralateral lateral mastoid, right? Um, and common reference montages are good for diffuse content. And I have to say, they're really, they're good for diffuse beta content. So you can rock out a linked ears montage if you have a low voltage fast EEG, it would do a good job displaying that kind of data. But if there's anything in the temporals, um, heartbeat slowing, you're really out of luck with a, with a common reference montage, right? And so this is the one that we all use the most, which is a linked ears montage, right? Linked ears is A1 plus A2 divided by two. So the ears, both ears are used uh, for every active channel, but there's also ipsilateral ear and contralateral ear, uh, not used too much. Um, overall, these common reference montages are again, good for global activity, but they're not good for focal activity. And so uh, this is one of the things that I learned far too late in my EEG career. And now it's something that I'm on a mission to pound into people's heads, which is when you see everything moving, electronegative or electropositive in lockstep, uh, what's happening is a, a Gaussian law of electricity is being violated. This is not humanly possible. For every up, there must be a down in the brain, right? There, we, it's a sphere, and out of that sphere, um, there's a balancing act in play. It's a sum zero game, right? And so you have to know when you're looking at something like this, where it looks like someone's run their fingers down the page, that you're looking at some contamination. Now, the contamination um, isn't necessarily bad. It's not dirt. It's not, you know, that the electroencephalographer did a bad job. It's common. It happens all the time. And often the contamination is going to be something in the temporal lobes, as we're seeing here, right? And so let's just pretend that T3, there's a focal slow at T3. And this is your first look at the EEG. You say, well, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of slow stuff in a linked ears montage. So you scratch your head, you say, well, what should I do? Well, um, let's take this example. Looking at this from the Monet perspective, the gestalt, you might see that there's a big old delta wave, like waves of an ocean, right? And so you might say, ah, linked ears montage is giving me a, uh, a temporal contamination. Well, rather, a temp the temporals are contaminating the ear electrode. And I, I can't see anything with this great big wave moving through the entire EEG. So I'm gonna change my montage or I'm not, and I'm gonna generate a report. What you'll see, regardless of the software used is um, an incredible amount of coherence and high amplitude Delta content, right? Why would you see coherence? Well, 
think about this. What's coherence? Coherence is the stability of the phase relationship between different sites in the brain. How stable are the phase relationships? Well, in this case, they're, they're you know, you can't discern one from the next. They're in lockstep, right? Those big old delta waves. And of course, the FFT is going to say, well, you know, they got a lot of delta in their brain, big high amplitude delta creating, right, our map. So here's another place where we'll see shared variants. This is a, a bad electrode. Now, you know a bad electrode when everything looks identical. This should really kind of make you go, oh, something's wrong. Something's not right. This is more than just a um, shared variant. This is more than just a, a um, contaminated electrode. If you go to an average reference, you can probably still save your EEG, but what you're going to get is um, a map where everything is moving in lockstep. So I'm gonna let this video play out in its entirety. I'm gathering a bunch of data. And if we move it to an average, things do start to look different. Back to linked ears, things look pretty gnarly. If we want to generate a quantitative EEG, what we're going to see with this is a map where every single coherence head is maxed out. And what that's saying is that the stability of the phase relationship of different sites in the brain is 100%. Um, um, everything is moving in lockstep. Delta matches with delta, theta matches with theta, alpha matches with alpha, and every electrode across the head. So does that mean that you have someone that's royally messed up? No, that means you have a bad electrode, right? Um, so one of the many false positives that we can get from coherences in a linked ears montage. It's one of the worst, however. So here we have a shared cardiac artifact. Now you can see that this is a heartbeat, just like the Delta one was a little bit ago, right? How do we know? Because it's rhythmic, it's approximately once per second. Um, and in this case, if you look at this, you might say, well, which ear is it coming from, the left or the right? And because we have a linked ears montage, um, the reference is gonna be shared, but it looks like T3 is the lowest, right? They don't have those same cardiac bursts. So that would point to T3 as the electrode that uh, has the less uh, amount of contamination. And this might be my favorite example. So we have an alpha head, right? Somebody with a ton of alpha in their data. Um, and this is going to happen to you. I'm sure it probably already has. So you think, oh my goodness, you know, so much alpha. They must really be a dreamer. Um, but what, what's more insidious in these alpha records is um, the shared variance, right? And partially because it's coming on and off. It's not 100% of the time that we see everything move in lockstep. And so what we do then is we alter the montage and we go to a Laplacian montage. And what a Laplacian will do is it's going to pull things out focally, right? And it says, ah, that alpha, that you were seeing everywhere, well, it's actually at T3, right? Maybe a touch at T5, but foremost, what do we have? We have temporal lobe alpha. It's a focal alpha. What does temporal lobe alpha indicate? It in indicates a frontal lobe disengagement. It's one of the ADHD profiles, very different than that global alpha profile we saw just a moment ago, right? So beware the shared, uh, shared variants. So it's going to lead me down a little philosophical rabbit hole, which is, can we trust coherence? And um, there's a handful of authors, um, this article, common reference coherence data are confounded by power and phase effects. And so, you know, this has been looked at. Um, and some of the fundamental findings are um, that two signals measured at the scalp can be confounded by spectral power and phase at reference, common reference electrodes, right? 
And both power and phase can alter coherence and create false positives. Therefore, common reference coherence data must be interpreted very cautiously. I'll say that one more time. Common reference coherence data must be interpreted very cautiously. And the authors actually recommended a whole new body of EEG coherence data using reference-free recording methods. This one, this article by Stephen Schiff is probably the best. It's the most um, metabolizable of all of the coherence articles. And what he says in dangerous phase is, the amplitude of a common reference can dominate the calculated phase of synchronization. One should probably never use the common referential EEG without reformatting. I love that because it's just a blanket statement. Like, don't just rely on linked ears. Acquiring the most advanced EEG equipment in the world and applying the most advanced signal processing techniques on the referential signals obtained will give junk measures of synchronization. Uh, Nunez out of UCLA. Even with suitable electrode coverage, 32 channels, 64 channels, whatever, one should anticipate spuriously, which means not real, spuriously large coherences from superficial dipoles at large interelectrode distances with the average common reference. So what he says is Laplacians calculated with the nearest neighbor electrodes spatially filter EEG significantly so that long range characteristics are eliminated and coherencies at long range are underestimated. Nevertheless, when properly performed, Laplacians give the best intermediate spatial range estimates of coherence, which would translate into your best way of um, looking at uh, coherences in the EEG. It's going to be Loretta coherences or Laplacian. Um, so what about this? Are these coherences erroneous? Let's find out. Everything's moving in lockstep. Uh, just seems a little bit too uniform for my taste. Not looking so good. The other thing that happens is, you know, linked ears makes artifacting a bear. And so if you find yourself in artifacting hell, then you're probably looking at the wrong montage, right? You should be able to artifact uh, with, with some ease, and that's going to depend upon where you are as a clinician, right? So in this recording, I've selected this data, and um, I want to see if these coherences are, are fake or not. Let's check our map, see what it says. Oh, um, those hypercoherences are absolutely 100% in lockstep. So, yeah, sorry, it's junk. Okay, same data, different database. Now we're using a Winnie EG database. Still going to use a linked ears montage, right? And you can perform coherences using different montages in Winnie EG. Now, what you can do with this, I'm going to look at coherence and phase spectra, that radial button to the right. The rule of thumb with Winnie EG is um, if it is um, above 2 but below 6, above 0.2 but below 0.6, you're in the normal range. And what we can see here is, let's add a map. The coherence is a 0.8 for alpha. Now let's change it to an average montage. Okay, so that was linked years. Oh good, I'm glad I'm doing that. Average weighted, which is the Laplacian, right? Can we see coherences differently now? Because linked ears said that those were hyper, we had some hypercoherent alpha. So I'm going to scale this guy. 
and uh, let's clock him. Now, point three, that's within the normal range for coherences. And we have a point two uh, coherence. So the data is uh, not erroneous um, when you're looking at a different montage. The moral of the story here with coherences, please, please be discerning with your data for the sake of your patients, for the sake of our field. Um, it's really important that you know what you're doing and what you're looking at. This is a presentation that I, I saw delivered a while back now. And the clinician said, my patient came in with a you know, hyper coherence in every bandwidth. And after my magical treatment, they were better. Look at the map on the right. And the truth of the matter is we have a bad EEG, we have a bad reporting. And you can see that from this data, just from the map itself, if you have a trained eye. So let's move into average reference because average reference is usually considered to be pretty innocent as references go. Um, average reference is where one electrode is, is compared to the sum of all the other guys divided by the number of electrodes. Sometimes FP1, FP2, O1, and O2 are omitted due to muscle. Sometimes T3, T4 are omitted due to muscle. This is my home base, right? This is good for uh, versatility, um, very comfortable, but it's the place from which you can launch. You can launch into linked ears where you go more global, or you can launch into a Laplacian or a bipolar where you go more focal. But average reference are also uh, susceptible to reference contamination. And um, that's due to what I call the tall man theory, right? Or the tall man in the EEG. Um, so if there's one electrode that's just a great big, great big guy, um, then of course that outlier is going to affect the average, isn't it? And it's going to be subtracted from every active electrode. So you'll probably see that, uh, that stuff contaminated everywhere. So this is a new neural field software, which I'm just learning to use. So if you're just learning to use it as well, uh, jump on my boat because I'm not very far from shore. One of the things that's cool is that you can see here the average reference will allow for you to choose between average one and average two. And average two, I'm going to hit pause there, um, is where FP1, FP2, T3, and T4 are omitted in the average calculation. So you can choose your average in neurofield. And this EEG that I have here is one where um, I have a great big temporalis muscle contamination at T4. So what would you do? Would you choose the average montage that kept the temporals in the uh, reference or would you choose the average that omitted the temporals from the reference? You would choose the one where T3, T4 is omitted. And this is what we get, right? And you don't see that, that beta, beta everywhere. It doesn't affect the overall average. And if you go to average one, things actually get a little bit more beta E. Check it. And then we're going to go back to the other one and up oh, a little bit less beta E. I don't know if you noticed it. I did it a couple of times just to make sure. But yes. So here's an EEG with a focal slow. Now, right now we're in an average montage and I'm going to circle it. There we see it. T3 and T5. There you see it at F8. And you might notice that your eyes aren't so good at discerning it. And so as we look at this, my little mouse is going to circle again and again the foci, the slow foci. But one of the things I want to uh, reassure you with or provide some solace with is that when everything seems to kind of go screwy all together, um, even if it's not shared variance from linked ears, you might be getting um, shared variance from an average montage. Right? Contamination from an average montage. And so here we go. Let's get away from this guy and just see what's going on from a Laplacian perspective. And Laplacian is really going to hunt down the home of that slow. 
right? And so I see it here at T4, but I'm going to cruise forward and there it is also at T3. So Laplacian is your friend. It's going to exaggerate things, right? It's like, it's like the friend that tells a story and you know that they've added, you know, like 20% of uh, extra cushion to, you know, just how, how big the story is, right? Laplacian is going to exaggerate things. Um, but everybody needs a friend like that, right? You just don't want to hang out with them all the time. And now to a linked ears. And this is the, this is the conformist, if I'm going to keep playing with that analogy, right? This is like everybody's doing the same thing. Uh, and, you know, you're sort of lost, right? You're out to, out to sea without a paddle. So let's talk about Laplacian. A Laplacian is a weighted average montage. And a weighted average montage is comparing each electrode to um, the, the electrodes that surround it, right? So we have input one, F4, input two, um, which is um, the uh, surrounding electrodes divided by their number. This is called a weighted average. And when you're referencing the channel or the derivation, you would say F4 uh, prime, right? This is used less in neurology because it's more difficult to conceptualize. And so I remember once talking to a neurologist early in my career and um, I had a disagreement uh, over a patient that he thought had a seizure. Um, and, uh, and he got mad at me in the call and he said, nobody uses Laplacian. And I was like, oh, I mean, it was totally news to me, but I think that he was actually quite defensive for a reason, right? There really was something to defend there, um, not in a good way. And so Laplacian makes things pop, right? Just like the right kind of like eyeshadow will make your eyes pop. Mu rhythms, occipital alpha, focal findings. I, I really love Laplacian for enunciating a morphological feature, um, but they're bad for global activity. Not good for medication, although you've probably been told that they are. Um, not good for other systemic things, right? So this little video is going to bounce between bipolar Laplacian and average. And right now we're in a Laplacian. No, 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 I lied. I'm sorry. Right now we're in a bipolar and we've got some midline uh, theta. We're back in the sleeping EEG and it's really hard to make heads from tails. Like we're seeing this everywhere. So where are we going next? We're going to go to a Laplacian montage. And Laplacian, our hero, really localizes what's happening. Right, and you can see clearly that this theta content is at the midline. Again, great for finding things that are focal. There's a little bit of phase and field at F3 and F4, C3 and C4, which we kind of want to see. Go to an average montage, and this is the example of an average montage being contaminated by a tall man. In this case, the tall man is the midline, right? The tall man is the midline. So I'm gonna just drop a little piece of knowledge here um, that might serve to confuse you, but might really serve to enlighten you. And it's this, you're gonna have an easy time finding phase and field in a linked years montage. It's going to get a little bit more difficult with an average and it's going to get even more difficult with Laplacian, right? Um, and, so, and so know that when you're looking for phase and field, tinkering with the montage is gonna change what you see. Right. And so what we have here is we have the surround of the discharge at the midline, the vertex sharp wave, completely jacking up the data. No bueno reference contamination. Even the innocent average montage has its shortcomings. And here's one more. Laplacian is great for mu. Laplacian is great for lambda, right? Now you, you might not even see the mu rhythm in here, right? Mu rhythm, what is it? It's a monomorphic waveform, a wicket rhythm. It lives at C3, C4 usually, though it can be expressed posteriorly at P3, P4 or anteriorly at F3, F4. There it is in its wicket shape, right? That one shape repeating, that monophasic waveform repeating C3, C4. And so we go to a Laplacian, it really draws out that morphology. Um, and, you know, it just makes more sense.
to look at and to understand what's happening, right? This is a frontal lobe disengagement. This is the uh, mirror neurons uh, not uh, communicating, right? So what we have here is somebody that's um, somewhat checked out, maybe ADHD, might be autistic. The Plossian and benzos. Now I know benzo is gonna have a, system, a systemic effect. This is your Ativan, your Xanax, your Clonopin, your Valium, and a um, linked ears montage, as we are right here, is you know giving us a bit of phase and field. And if you back up, you can see it. Again, like a Monet painting, you can see the, the overall gestalt and you should scratch your head and say, meh, not quite right. What a Laplacian is gonna do is it's gonna push that spindle up to the top, right? And it's going to be the sides uh, with fewer electrodes that aren't going to show it as strongly, right? And so CZ is, is the one that's going to show the high amplitude uh, beta spindle that is the consequence of the benzodiazepine. So why is, why is Laplacian not a good one for medication? Because medications show a global effect, right? Medications are going to affect the, the entire being. The blood-brain barrier is not going to be choosy about where those medications get in and what part of the cortex are affected. Um, this is going a medication um, in something that inflames the brain, a toxin. They're all going to have a global effect, right? And so this final video is all montages. And we're right now in a linked ears montage. Now this is a rugby player who sustained a head injury. And you can see, ah, now that I know the shortcoming of uh, linked ears, I can see that there's, uh, there's shared variance, right? Across every electrode, which means that that slow thing is in one of the temporals, right? That's gonna be in T3, T4, F7, F8, or T5, T6. So I'm gonna jump over to an average. And an average is gonna take every electrode, compare it to the average of all the others. And we see, some of the slow content jumps out, right? There's a lot of EMG in this, which might serve to confuse. And so if you're still scratching your head and saying, I really can't make heads from tails, you know, I see that there's some slow content temporally, you can go to a Laplacian montage and see what? Well, then the focal findings are gonna be even more exaggerated. And if you're like me, you're gonna notice that C3, which is a um, combination of beta and alpha. It probably is um, even a little bit of mu. We can see that fr those frontal beta spindles, and then you can see that midline slowing. It's easy. And a bipolar is going to localize, right? And in this case, it's localizing something at C3. And again, it's that slow content. So it seems to me, this looks like a mu rhythm that's buried in beta. So with that, I'm gonna end, um, but I have to do something here because um, this is a, uh, this, is, this is what I'm supposed to do. Um, this is not my style. But um, I asked my uh, PR marketing manager to, to draw this stuff up today. Um, of course, our, our, our website went down. But listen, um, if you are interested in learning more about this kind of stuff, um, we're trying to sort of pump up the membership of our golden members. This is a monthly deal. Uh, well, it's an annual deal, but basically we do tons of lectures um, on all kinds of things. We have guest lectures, the 2023 year, we're going to have um, people from all different schools of thought come to lecture because the School of Neurotherapy is really software and hardware agnostic. And I, my, my hope, my goal is that everybody who wants to learn anything about neurofeedback can learn it um, at this site, right? Not necessarily taught by me. Um, so we're doing a golden membership discount. Um, and then um, next year, I'm going to do a whole new slide deck, a whole new deck of neurotherapy for specific conditions things I haven't covered yet. Um, and so my goal here is a lot of profiling. Um, so far, they've been great. Um, I'm planning on covering things like insomnia, uh, migraines, um, things that I haven't spent any time on yet, just so that we can all collectively sort of synthesize our data, uh, our profiling data, and know as much as we can. So 
Um, if if you if you're into this, great. You know, um, thank you, Teo, for putting these together. Um, he'll send you a uh, a code in case you want to uh, do that thing and uh, jump on. So I'm going to stop there. And um, thank you for listening to this little lecture. I hope you got something out of it. Um, I have a couple minutes. If anybody has any questions, um, no guarantees I can answer them, but I'm happy to give it a shot. I th think Donna might be speaking, but I'm not sure. No. Cool. All right, right on. Well, thanks you guys. Thanks for tuning in and um, nice seeing your faces. Our minds are all blown. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, Tiff. That was amazing. Good. Really important information. Good. Nice. I appreciate you guys. Thanks. Aw, he's in his car. Uh, you guys are my friends. Good to see you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Happy Monday. Have a good week. See you later.